welcome to the launch. I say launched because we are launching OASPA's Wayfinders in this session. Now, last I heard, we had more than 500 registrants. We had registrations from across over 55 countries and over 380 organizations. So a really, really warm welcome to you from wherever in the world you are. Thank you for making time for this. For now and forever, I'm so happy to say that you are part of the launch of our Wayfinders. And if I could take a few minutes before I introduce our speakers for today to just talk you through what the Wayfinders is all about, right? So last year, under the guidance of OASPA's Equity in Open Access Working Group, we focused on bringing publishing, library, and other stakeholders together in a series of four workshops. And these were scoped to look at equity and open access. And particularly, we were looking at how we can increase equity in access to open access publishing, right? So we chose this facet of equity in particular because OASPA sees that alongside massive consolidation in the pay to publish route to achieving open access, there's also a massive issue with the exclusion of researchers. And we are worried that without a diversity of ways to achieve open access, we're failing a majority of the world's researchers if open access continues on its current trajectory in terms of routes and ways to achieve it. So we think we can do this in a more inclusive way, in a more equitable way. And that's why we scoped the equity and OA workshops last year. Uh, and, and that was our starting point, right? Dissolving the barriers to those who want to publish open access. And when our workshop series ended, we distilled down all our learnings and we presented findings about what we think or what we thought was most useful for OASPA to do next. And um, in and amongst other ways of getting that feedback, one thing we did was to also present that at our own annual meeting in September last year. And what we heard from all of the feedback that we received was that while there were many, many things that it might be helpful for us to do next, OASPA's members and, and stakeholders were really telling us that as a top priority, they wanted OASPA to share examples, information, uh, facilitate discussion around how we can build equity and open access in terms of how this is already happening, right? Where is this already taking place and what can we learn from that? And if you're interested in the full list, by the way, that popped up on the slide there, don't worry, none of that's a secret. You can follow the link on there that will be put in chat as well. So that was a number of things that OASP are thinking about as next steps. But this is a priority and this is why we're here today um, to, to sort of birth the OASPA Wayfinder series and and bring these kinds of discussions to life for you. So with that in mind, um, we have this idea that our Wayfinders discussions will give you examples that they will amplify and highlight and help you discuss these examples of those who are increasing equity in open access in a variety of ways. And that variation is important, right? We know that this diversity of routes to open access is needed because we have different contexts, we have different global regions, we have different disciplines, um, and we also have different um, availability of funding in different ways to even sustain open access publishing, right? So given all of that, we want to give you a very broad and various a coverage of various examples and our hope is that across all that you might hear in the Wayfinder series throughout 2024 that um, you will get some inspiration and ideas that you could apply to your own context right and and think about how your own organization can then um, increase equity in open access and with this all in mind our discussion today, so this is now specifically about today's initial starter Wayfinder conversation, we're going to bring to life four different publishing approaches that are building equity and open access. Our Wayfinders today, and you can see them up there on the screen, they span journals and books, humanities and science publishing, 
Um, and they also represent publishing efforts that support authors who are based in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Northern Hemisphere, and in low and middle income countries. We will hear about both pilot projects and very established publishing operations. So in all of this, I hope, I really hope that there will be something in the discussions today that is helpful or interesting to every one of you making time uh, to join us here today. With Danny, we will look at the APC model in a new light. With Megan, we will look at the importance of the repository route from the context of inclusion. Ross will help us look at a collective model for books, it, books in the humanities. Uh, and with Susan, we will look at, you know, juggling a whole variety of journal models and maybe be able to compare a little bit the pay to publish route and what it looks like to have a subsidy model where there are no fees to read or to publish open access. So huge thanks to Susan, Megan, Ross and Danny for being willing to talk about their journeys towards uh, building more equitable open access. So as we go through their four talks, what's going to happen is each speaker will present for 10 minutes. And then uh, what we would like is to have all of the Q&A and discussion right at the end. We definitely want to hear from you. So if you have a question during any of the talks or at any point for any of us, then please pop your question into the Q&A section, into the Q&A box. Um, that will make sure that we can look at that. The chat is for comments and resources and reactions and things like that. But if you do have a question, we don't want it to be missed. So please make sure that we can, uh, please help us by putting that in the Q&A box. And I will just say upfront, if we don't get to all of your questions, we will work as hard as we can to collect up answers from our panelists and post a document online with the recording of this at the end. So we do really hope that this will be discussion driven at the end. But first, we will have our presentations and I will move over to um, introducing Danny to you as he will be taking us through eCancer's case in the first instance. Danny is CEO of eCancer. eCancer is a global charity that is raising the standards of care for cancer patients right across the world through education. And eCancer's journal is completely open access at the point of publication, operating a pay what you can afford model. Danny, welcome. Please tell us more. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll just uh, get my slides up and then we can um, get into it. But hopefully you can all see that now. Yep. Looks good. Thank you. Fantastic. Great. So welcome everybody. Yeah, thank you for joining us. It's great that there's so many people um, interested in these discussions and hopefully we'll have a really great event. I'm sure we will. So as mentioned, I'm from eCancer. Um, oh, hold on a second. My slides aren't moving. Uh, can you still see the first slide? Yeah. Ah, okay, hold on. Let's see if that works. Ah, okay, great. So I'm CEO. Yeah. I'm uh, sorry. I'm Danny Burke. I'm the CEO of eCancer. As mentioned, we're an educational charity focused on improving cancer care globally through education. And really, as part of what we do and the work that we do, it's looking at focusing on breaking down barriers to high quality cancer education. We do this predominantly through our website, which is uh, ecancer.org. And we also run educational events uh, globally um, to support the, the oncology community in various parts of the world. Um, just to give you a bit of background about the journal itself, so eCancer Medical Science, which is the name of our journal, was launched in 2007. Uh, originally, we were the journal of the European Institute of Oncology, um, which is based in Milan. Um, and then we've kind of, over the years, we've, um, we still work with them a little bit, but kind of disassociated ourselves from them. But we publish around 160 articles a year, which are viewed around about a million times. And from the point of um, launch, we it was always free to publish in our, in our um, in our journal because because we saw uh, the cost of publication, the cost to authors, as being a barrier to um, publishing. But um, you know this was obviously quite a difficult model to sustain. So 
in the in 2014 we introduced the pay what you can afford model um and we've been running that ever since um in 2020 we um had a kind of strategic review of the organization and we really looked around and thought you know what are we doing what are we trying to achieve as an organization you know a lot of the people who published with us would were doing this for free or at very low cost but really they were from quite significant um you know um institutes around europe and could easily afford to pay the um a, a publication fee um but over that time we've um, enabled over 5,000 authors to publish with us for free, but we decided to focus the resources that we had on supporting authors and researchers from low and middle income countries and other under supported communities from, from 2022, sorry, 2020. So that feeds into our um, goal and our mission as an organization as breaking down barriers. So from this point, from 2022 onwards, we only considered articles that have at least one author from a low middle income country or another under supported community or research that directly impacts on these groups and supports their work. Um, we also don't reject papers um, because of, you know, superficial reasons, if you like. So if there are, you know, if it's got spelling mistakes, if it's, you know, not formatted correctly, instead of reject, if the science is robust, instead of rejecting these papers, we work with the authors to support them through the publication process. With it, always in mind that a lot of our authors, English isn't their first language, so we support them through that process. And all of our articles are completely open access from the point of publication. Again, um, you know, articles being published in, in a non-open access environment, that is a, that is a barrier. Um, to, to education and you know we are all about breaking down these barriers we also have um, a policy that you can publish in Spanish and if accepted then we translate them into the article into, into English and publish the abstract in Spanish and, and English and the article itself in English and all of that is for free and that is predominantly to support authors and researchers in Latin America where we have quite a significant footprint as an organization and also we obviously have the pay what you can afford approach to fees which breaks down financial barriers so how does the pay what you can afford model work so when an article is accepted we communicate with the corresponding author and encourage them to find access to any funds that they may have available um, to support with the publication costs um, we will support the author and you know any other authors on the paper that want to get involved into seeking any funding that they believe is available um you know we have quite an experienced fundraising team within the organization so we will uh, support them through putting together bids if that's how it goes or you know applying to their institute whatever the process is and also just identifying whether funds are available um is part of that process but if there is no funding available we publish their article for free, but we, all, we often find that, especially with authors that we've worked a lot with through the publication process to support them to get their paper up to the level that we require, authors will often pay out of their own pocket. And obviously that means that we have a, a, a wide variety of, of, um, of donations from ranging from kind of, you know, very small up to you know, a few hundred pounds if authors are, um, you know, can afford it. So why do we do this? You know, this is quite a significant impact on the organization. Um, and why do we see it as being so important? Well, you know, the, the cancer is a huge challenge for, for, um, for low and income countries, especially with three quarters of all cancer deaths expected to occur there by 2030. But there's, no, there's a lack of clinical trials um, and of publications from these countries with, you know, you can see only 8% of trials are conducted in low and income countries with around about 12% of articles. But, and the cancer control strategies that are effective in high income countries, which are what, are base, what forms the basis of a lot of cancer control plans, national cancer control plans, and a lot of um, drug uh, research, but then often not applicable for low and middle income countries for various different factors, including different health systems, different disease characteristics, 
and other factors. Therefore, it's imperative that low and middle income countries can conduct their own research to address local and regional problems with, with the solutions that are acceptable to their populations. And, and you know, that really gives um, healthcare professionals and oncology professionals who are treating patients in these countries relevant research that they can base their, their decision making process on, which is ultimately going to impact patients' lives and whether they have a good quality of life or, or whether they survive or not. So it's vital that we're able to do this. So obviously, um, you know, it, it, it does have an impact on the organisation being able to offer this service. So let's have a, have a think about the challenges. So we often find that it kind of goes with human nature. You know, the, people don't want to necessarily buy the, you know, this Tesco own brand versus Heinz baked beans or whatever it might be, because people relate the quality of something to the directly to the cost. So we have to kind of overcome that barrier uh, often with the authors themselves to everyone or people often, in, especially in the early days, used to assume that there was something kind of fishy going on, that we, why would we be offering this service for, for free or at low cost where, no, where very few others are doing that? So, you know, we try it. We obviously have robust peer review and we run our journal to, the, to high international standards. Um, but we often have to kind of communicate that with authors um, to ensure that they are confident with submitting their, their article to us. Um, I mean, as we've been around since 2007, this is something that it, we're facing kind of less and less as we become more and more well known within um, low and middle income countries. But it's certainly something that is to, that needs to be considered. Also, communicating the importance of, of what we do, this element of what we do to funders is, is, is really tricky and it is vital because we fund this work through our charitable funds. So, you know, when I speak to our trustees, I have to justify this as a cost to the organisation. We seek external funding to supplement the money that we get from the authors. But being able to communicate the importance of what we do to funders is extremely tricky. Um, because, uh, you know, unless you're in the world of scientific publications, then it's not um, necessarily pe the type of thing that laymen uh, understand as being fundamental to the process of, of research. And then also maintaining reasonable costs while offering a high quality service is extremely difficult. The, um, ultimately, the more successful we are, the more papers we receive and, um, and attract the more the co our cost base is. So we just, we have to maintain reasonable costs that allow the organization to continue to support this work. And so in terms of the sustainability of what we do, so just the overall figures really, 14% of the published articles that we, the, the articles that we publish run, result in some kind of payment. The average payment is just over 400 pounds. So what we, tend to find is that we get more um, payments from individual authors out of their own pocket than we do from their institutions, but the, the average uh, payment from the institutions is higher than it is when it comes from an individual. So we've received a, around about £30,000 in, in the past two years towards this. So it is substantial income, but it doesn't cover our costs. But as I said earlier, we supplement the rest of the cost through charitable funds. We have a fundraising department. We go to charitable trusts and other organizations to attract income to, su to supplement those costs. And the aim is for the journal to break even um, by the, the end of 2025. But that would always be a mix of um, charitable funds as well as um, funds from the authors themselves. So really, we're all about increasing equity, equality, which is what we've been discussing, you know, what this, this webinar is all about. And I just wanted to leave the last word to our director, our chair of trustees, Richard Sullivan. We know that there is a huge amount of a tsunami of cancer cases coming, and we have to ramp up scholarly output to help support the healthcare communities at the front line of this crisis. The scholarly publishing system isn't fair as it stands. We know there are inherent Western biases and we need to do something about it. You know, we are a, a relatively small organization um, within a huge 
world of publishing and you know we do what we can to to support authors and researchers from low and income countries um but we'd love to do more um but you know we, the kind of practicalities of, of life um mean that we can do as much as we can but um you know we're out there doing something what whenever we can to support those guys so i'd just like to say thank you to everyone for listening and thank you for awaspa for um inviting me to speak today and um it's at the end of the end of the all of the talks but i look forward to hearing your questions later on and these are my references thanks very much Great. Thank you so much, Danny. That was uh, that was brilliant. Um, thank you for telling us how e-cancer sort of not just breaks down barriers, but is also addressing that lack of, of the, the scientific trials, the clinical trials happening for patients who have cancer in lots of these countries and, and then getting that public, getting those publications out there, treating publishing as a cost and, and, and you know, um, therefore sort of trying to address um, one of the things I think OASPA finds itself talking about when we talk about equity is it's not just about equality, it's about addressing the issues of cumulative advantage. And that really uh, comes out in the efforts there from uh, eCancer. So thank you for sharing with us. And we move on to Megan, Megan Phelan, who is communications director for the science family of journals. Um, she works to boost the visibility of forthcoming journal content for reporters worldwide. Previous to her role at AAAS, she has been a science writer, a science reporter, and a Fulbright scholar. Megan, I'm turning it over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Malavika. Thank you, OASPA, for having me. And thank you, Danny. Really enjoyed your presentation. I will share my slides now and look forward to talking to everybody. Thank you for your patience. And while we just wait, give Megan a moment to bring her slides up, if I can just uh, remind you to put your questions in the Q&A box, that way we will see it, that we have a busy chat going on. Um, so it will help us make sure we are addressing your questions if you can pop them into the Q&A chat, because we'd love you to make the most of the four wonderful speakers we have here today. And Megan, it's back to you, thanks. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. I trust everyone can see my slides. As Malavika mentioned, I'm Megan Phelan. I'm the communications director for the Science Family of Journals, Science and its six or five sibling journals. We are published by the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest multi-science science society. And I'm going to talk about open access today with a focus on uh, the two lenses that AAAS and science leadership have really been making a focus, and that is preserving editorial quality and author inclusivity. All right, so I think as many of you here know, um, there are many flavors, if you will, of open access. And um, this slide attempts to outline some of those. I won't go into detail about each one, except I'd like to um, emphasize the, the flavors that we have at the Science Family, where we publish six journals. So five of our journals, including Science, our oldest journal, our flagship journal, use green open access. Access. This is the model where the author doesn't pay anything to make their paper open. Um, they can deposit the author accepted manuscript, so the version after peer review and very close to, to the final in a repository of their choice. Green is the model that we have for five of our journals. And then we also have a gold open access journal in Science Advances, which is an interdisciplinary journal that was launched in 2015. As we've been thinking about open access at AAAS, we believe that it matters greatly which flavor of open access becomes predominant. The issues at stake are significant, and we talk a lot about these at AAAS uh, with leadership, with our editors, and with the authors that we're serving. 
The issues at stake are author inclusivity, as has already been discussed today, and also scientific quality and integrity. We really believe that public access should foster a diverse universe, not only of readers, but also of authors. This is regardless of their economic circumstances. We also think that um, gold open access can damage scientific quality and integrity when it incentivizes a volume business model, when it's more focused on volume than quality. At the science family, um, our this is a picture on my screen of our, our CEO at AAAS, Sudip Parikh, who is also our executive publisher. He he says that the science family journals are fully open access, that between our green and gold offerings, we're fully compliant with both the, the U.S. requirements for open access, the, the Nelson memo that was put forward in August 22, and requirements in Europe, uh, Plan S. So... Um, even though we have models that include gold and green, when we look at the our body of work and how it can be made accessible to the public, it is truly fully open access. Some people have wondered how long AAAS has been has been doing green in particular. So how long we've been compliant with the public access memos that are out there? Did it take the Nelson memo in August 2022, for example, which we've been hearing a lot about, to push us there? AAAS has supported green open access for over two decades. So we've been active in the green open access space for a very long time, believing that it's critically important that all of the research from the Science Family Journals can be represented to an interested public. Uh, we've supported it long before the Nelson memo in 2022 and, and the memo before that and the U.S. Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Holdren memo in 2013. Now, previously, um, the way that green open access worked at the Science Family Journals was that authors could post the author accepted manuscript to their institutional page, so their, their university or college's research uh, page or to their personal page, um, and they had to wait to do it for six months for uh, any postings they wanted to do to PubMed Central. But in January 2023, so a year ago today, we expanded our two decades old green open access policy even further. This is this is really cool. Now authors at the Science Family can place their accepted manuscript in any public repository, including PubMed Central, immediately upon publication. So no delay, not for any repository, uh, and any repository can be used. When we announced that we were um, putting more support behind green open access this way, last year in January, we received wide support, a lot of excitement from the authors that we work with and from others. So our, our approach, we think, sets us apart from publishers pursuing public access models that even as they enable access for readers, they could lower content quality and they could exclude some scientists from publishing world-changing science. We're really proud of this approach. Now, it, green open access is sometimes criticized for different reasons. I think the two most prominent are those that I flagged on the screen. The first is discoverability. Um, it, may, it could be hard for people to find the author accepted manuscript they're looking for on an institutional repository or in another repository. We don't tend to hear complaints about this very often, and we think that's because the authors who are sharing their pieces, their author accepted manuscripts in these different repositories are also pretty good about telling the people who want to, to find the work where they can find it. Another significant and sensitive issue in the green open access space is that not every publisher feels they can pursue green open access and still receive subscription payments. And, and we're sensitive to this. We think, you know, it works at the science family because we're publishing not only research, but we have an award-winning news department and we have an insight section that we publish every week of policy forums and editorials and perspectives. Um, the librarians, the institutions we, we work with say they really believe in the mission and what we're doing in public that body of work, the news and insights, so they're going to continue to pay, even, even if the research is all open via green open access. There are other publishers who are using green. Uh, we were excited to see a piece in stat last year by JAMA's new, at the time, editor-in-chief, uh, Kristen Bibbins-Domingo, talking about how they too were pursuing green and why we're doing that. And I love a quote from her in that piece. What we're saying is we believe in open access and we also believe in the value of, 
of what we do. We still think people will pay to subscribe to JAMA because there's value in the final version of record, the graphics editors making the figures, the podcasts, the corrections that get posted over time, all of those extra features and efforts to enhance the paper and keep it updated are things the science family journals do as well. So AAAS has really been trying to lead in talking about these equity and quality issues in the open access space. Some of the ways we're doing that are listed on the screen. Maybe some of you are familiar with these, but we led a survey on trade-offs researchers um, might face to pay APC fees in 2022. And on the AAAS website, uh, the results of that survey are posted. And it was pretty clear that researchers uh, face some significant trade-offs in terms of professional development and um, resources they might buy for their labs and people they might hire to support their work when they have to prioritize APC fees. We also published a notable editorial by Suda Parikh, our, our CEO, who I mentioned before, and two other leaders at AAAS in, in 2022. Uh, public access is not equal access. I'd be happy to share a link to that. We've responded to various requests for information on public access, notably from the Nas uh, National Institutes of Health and NASA, where they were looking for insight on how to do public access well. We emphasized that equity was really important and quality was really important. That was work we did last year, 2023. We also led last year in July, a big um, event I'll talk about in the next slide, uh, where we convened for the first time the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. They had put out the, the Nelson memo and, and we convened several major funders, NASA, NSF, DOE, and NIH, to talk about how they were developing their public access plans. And then we brought in several early career researchers to kind of pressure test the ideas that the agencies were suggesting as they were developing their public access plans. And we continued, as a last note on the slide, we continued to do talks with researchers at institutions of all types uh, about open access and the way it's being shaped. We continue to share our view in all these events and with these audiences that public access should optimize equity for readers and authors. And we've been pleased to see that official definition of open science released by OSTP in 2023 included a focus on equity. We're also seeing equity appear in the continuing um, public access plans for major funders like NIH and NASA. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that webinar that I mentioned we held last July with OSTP and several major funders. We, we really wanted to get the funders on the record talking about the open access plans they were developing in response to the Nelson memo. And we wanted them to respond to questions about equity and scientific quality. So we asked all of the funders, NSF, NASA, DOE, and NIH, five equity and qual scientific quality related questions. And I wanna give you um, an example of how they responded. I'm going to show you NASA's responses to our five questions. It turns out that all four of the agencies responded similarly. So this is representative. So we ask them, you know, what version of a manuscript would you require for compliance? We were curious to see if the author accepted manuscript, which would facilitate green OA, would be acceptable. And NASA and all the other agencies we talked to said, yes, the author accepted manuscript would um, meet their compliance uh, standards as they were developing them. That's shown in the first column here. Uh, in the second column, we were asking them about researcher access to publish, basically uh, trying to get at whether the researchers they were funding would still be able to choose where they wanted to publish based on you know, the standards set up by different publishers, the audiences different publishers reach the quality the, that different publishers made a focus. And all of the funders said that um, author choice would continue to be um, a feature of the of how they would proceed in their public access plans. We asked Megan, about- uh -huh. Sorry to interrupt your flow, Megan. I'm just ch chipping in to say we're tight on time. So I'm hoping you'll be wrapping up soon, if that's okay for the 10 minutes. Thank you. Yes, I can. Thanks, Malavika. I can absolutely do that. So on this slide, I'll just emphasize that uh, all the funders we talked to said they were going to make scientific integrity um, a focus of their public access plans, and they were also going to monitor costs for researchers as they were paying for public access. And I'm wrapping up. I just want to say that in that event, 
early career researchers who we invited to kind of be on the panel and pressure test the agency's responses um, felt very heard. They were able to raise the concerns that they had about developing open access plans. We thought that was particularly important as we've heard that researchers have sometimes felt left out in open access policies as they're developed. I just, with two slides to go, wanted to make clear that there is some content that the science family journals make freely available immediately. Um, and these are articles of immediate relevance to public health and, and various other pieces. So those things are kind of outside the green open access. And if authors ask if their papers can be made free, you know, sometimes they don't know quite how things work and we tell them, yes, absolutely. You can deposit your author accepted manuscript, no cost to you. And they've been very excited to receive this news. So that is, those are all my slides. Thank you, Malavika. Thank you, Megan. And sorry to interrupt your flow earlier, but I want to make sure everyone uh, has their chance to unpack their slide deck. So thank you for that uh, inf uh, information uh, from the AAAS point of view. Um, everyone, keep your questions coming. Some great questions coming through in the chat. It's now the turn of Ross. Uh, Ros Pine, she leads the open access team at Bloomsbury Academic. She's worked in open access policy roles for over a decade. She has a particular interest in bringing OA to long form outputs. She sits on the advisory boards for the Books OA Toolkit and OAPEN. Roz, give us the book's view and tell us what's happening at Bloomsbury. And Roz, you are on mute, but hopefully not for long. Sorry, I just need to sort out my screen sharing, which currently was working, which was working completely fine earlier, but there we go. All right. Um, so, hi. Yeah, I'm Roz. Um, I um, lead open access at Bloomsbury Academic, and I'm going to pivot away from journals and from science to talk about monographs in the humanities and social sciences. And that is what we do at Bloomsbury. We, as an academic publisher, publish books in the arts, humanities and social sciences and related digital resources. And we launched Bloomsbury Open Collections as a collective action OA model. So we launched this in a pilot form last year with the aim of making 20 of our monographs in African studies and international development open access immediately on publication at no cost to the author. And I've said this is a collective action model. And by that, I mean that we're essentially asking libraries that might otherwise have purchased these books that have an interest in the subject area to instead put their funds towards a model that will support open access for those books. And when I say collective action, we structured this around a collection of books, these 20 titles. We set a funding target and said, when we get to that target, we will flip the books to OA. And the idea was that we wanted those libraries to act together. So rather than a few libraries contributing and us saying, OK, we'll make a couple of books available OA, which might create an incentive for everyone to sit and say, oh, I'll just wait for everybody else to see if they can, will contribute. Instead, we wanted this to be a group of libraries that were interested in this area coming together to help flip their library budgets to supporting open access. Um, we did put a 50% threshold in, so we committed that as soon as we'd achieved the money for 50% of the books to go OA, we would confirm OA for those. And that was at the request of libraries who wanted to make sure that there was a good chance that their funds would support an open access model. We built in some private benefits for participating libraries. We know that sometimes for libraries, it's important when you're justifying that budget line to say, oh, I got something specifically for my students, for my researchers, um, rather than just contributing for the common good. So all of those libraries also get one year's access to almost 200 related backlist titles. And that forms a subscription element in that if you keep participating in each year's open collections, then you will retain access to that full backlist. And we also guaranteed access to all the 20 titles in the event that we didn't make the full funding target and some of them didn't publish open access. I'm going to talk really briefly about our African studies and international development books that we focused the pilot on. So this includes the Z imprint, and they have long been known as leading sources of critical, decolonial and anti-colonial approaches to social sciences research. And it is a particular aim for us in these lists to foreground and promote research on and from the global south. So 
when we were thinking about how we offered open access for our research monographs, we started from the perspective that we wanted an equitable alternative to the BPC model. We have experimented with various approaches to open access um, ever since Bloomsbury launched an academic publishing arm in 2008. But up until we launched this pilot, the vast majority of our books that were going OA were going OA through a BPC model. And we were really uncomfortable with the disparities in that, with the fact that although we do publish authors um, from all around the world, although we do publish authors who might be unaffiliated or early career researchers, they are very poorly represented in our open access publishing, which tends to focus on established authors at rich institutions in the global north. So our core aim was to enable a more diverse range of authors to benefit from open access, to get the additional visibility, usage, citations that we know open access can bring. And we particularly wanted to support Global South authors because we felt there was an imbalance there. In choosing that African Studies list, the International Development Studies list, we saw an ethical argument for increasing local access to region specific content. That is, we want to make sure that institutions based in Latin America, in Africa, can access research that is done by scholars in their countries, that is about um, their countries. But we also, looking to the global north, knew that a lot of universities that we speak to in Europe, in America, are looking to decolonialize their curriculum, to provide more diverse viewpoints, to get out of entrenched ways of approaching uh, subjects and topics. And we felt that by making books in these areas open access, we could contribute to that. And finally, in our aims, we just want to publish more of our books open access. We think that's the trajectory we should be on. And we felt that with a fee model, we were only going to get so far. So we needed to find other routes to provide open access to these books. So we launched the pilot in March last year. Libraries could participate up until the end of, of the year. And then the aim was to publish the books over the course of 2024. So we've just closed the collections. And actually, I'm now for the first time going to share where we've landed in that pilot. Um, so we achieved 50% of our funding target, pretty much exactly. And as a result, we're going to be making 10 books open access at no cost to the authors. And in selecting those 10 books from our original collection of 20, we have prioritized authors based in the global south. So we were just adding this up earlier. So there are 58 authors in total across chapter authors in edited collections and um, authors and editors of the books themselves. Um, of those 17 are based in the Global South, several more are scholars who originally uh, were born and raised and studied in the Global South, but have since moved to Global North universities. We also have included in their unaffiliated researchers, um, an early career researcher. Um, so we're not saying that all of the authors that are um, in this collection are from the Global South, but it does represent a substantial shift in the balance compared to what we usually see in our OA publishing. It is a start, we start from here. And I guess I fundamentally believe that over time, if we all accumulate these small changes, if we learn from them, if we build on them, then together we can move to something that is more equitable. Um, what did we learn? Um, we found authors were mostly really enthusiastic. Um, so I've got a quote here from some of the authors whose books will go away in September about how important it was for books to be more open access if we want academia to be more inclusive and accessible. One interesting thing was that in launching this pilot, we ended up talking to some authors that hadn't engaged much with open access because it hadn't been an option for them. And so they had some concerns, but they were ones that were not about this model. It was more, will my book still appear in print? Um, would you still promote my book in the same way that you would have anyway? Once we reassured them, everyone was happy to participate. Institutions definitely appreciated the focus on increasing equity in open access publishing. We also heard you know, this quote I have here from the university librarian at Lehigh, support for scholarship produced by diverse researchers located in different areas of the world enriches our perspective and it's aligned with our strategic mission to develop more inclusive collections. We did find subject relevance was key. So for example, uh, we had universities in Australia saying, this is really interesting in principle, African studies isn't a priority for us, so we can't sign up to this particular collection. 
we would say readiness to engage with this sort of model for books varied really substantially. Some universities were completely on it. They had working groups where their open access and their ebook acquisitions teams were already talking. They had criteria. They were really quickly able to review our model and choose to sign up. In some cases, it was really new to people. They asked a lot of questions. They were interested in theory, but it took many months to navigate an internal approvals process for what was quite a new model. And I think it's that uh, variation in readiness to engage, which makes us most nervous about substantially scaling up this model because we think that we need to co collaborate together to make sure that everyone is ready to take that sort of step. And I should also note that consortia played an important role. We partnered with Lyricis and with JISC and 13 of the US universities and 10 of the UK universities that signed up did so via JISC. Um, what about us? We would, I think amongst our editorial team, there was huge enthusiasm for this approach. We definitely found it challenging that we didn't know whether the books would publish open access. So we couldn't put them into our standard sales routes because they might go OA, but we also didn't know for sure. And that's something we're looking at in terms of the timeframes and how we can structure the model in relation to our sort of regular publishing. I will say we now offer obviously the standard sales model. And in fact, I think all book publishers end up offering some kind of sales model because all book publishers are pretty much selling the print. We also continue to offer the BPC model, particularly for authors who have a funder requirement for OA and have funding available for BPCs. We now have Bloomsbury Open Collections. That does add cost and complexity. And really, this is a transformation project. This is about thinking differently about what we do and how we do it. That involves the people, the culture, the systems throughout our organization, throughout our publishing. And I think that is a journey that we've just started on. And there is work to be done, but it's exciting. Um, what happens next? We're definitely committing to continuing with this model. We want to continue to focus on authors from underrepresented groups and subjects where we think there's an ethical imperative to increase access to the research. Um, and we'll be announcing in March our next steps in that respect. Um, in the meantime, we OSPA have very kindly um, shared a blog which has some more reflections on what we've learned from this model. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rose, uh, for doing more open access, but looking for equitable alternatives to the BPC um, and uh, for keeping to time as well. Oh, I need to stop my video. Sorry. There we go. Hello. Um, and so thank you for that, Rose. And we move over to our final speaker, um, Susan, who is director of the Scholarly Publication Unit at the Academy of Sciences in South Africa. She's held that role since 2009. She has a very illustrious library and consortia background. She advocates for opening up the entire research process and she works to facilitate optimal use and access to publicly funded research. Welcome, Susan, please tell us more. Thank you, Malavika, uh, really um, great to be here. Greetings here from South Africa. And um, then thank you very much for us, but also allowing us um, to present. And thank you to the previous presenters. I think there's some very interesting rhetoric and models emerging um, from all these discussions. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions after this. Um, as Malavika actually alluded to when she introduced the session is that I had a little bit of a, of a concern when I saw sort of the title that has been allocated to me, uh, namely running fee free science journals. And, and I had to step back from it and, and think about it specifically where I am from the Academy of Sciences of South Africa to think, well, you know, the only one fee free journal that we do have is really actually South African Journal of Science um, in our control and not necessarily in the control of South Africa. Uh, but then I thought what we are doing quite a bit um, in, in our country is advancing equity and inclusion in scholarly publishing, um, which has a diff little bit of a different spin as to what we've heard thus far, but, but let's proceed. I just thought I'd raise this question again, and we've got to be very careful, and I think especially in the open access field slash open science field, is how we start sort of defining our services and what we bring about. Um, the terminology of, of, of gold and green and diamond, et cetera, has been coming a long way. Um, but we must be reminded that there's nothing like a free lunch because there are a huge amount of costs of decision making and consumption taking place. And 
that it suggests that things that appear to be free will always have some hidden or implicit cost to someone, even if it's not the individual receiving the benefit. And I think that's very important in, in the world that we live in, in scholarly publishing and how we fund actually access to journals and how do we provide then equity and be inclusive at the same time. It's quite a challenge and, and I think we have to sort of um, start putting our ideas around that um, specifically. Um, so just for information, in South Africa, there's 332 South African published journals, 195 are open access journals, so that's about two thirds of the of um, journals being published in South Africa. Vast uh, variety of publishers, um, like any other um, country, which brings about its own challenges, being a society or the government or a university or a commercial publisher or a commercial open access publisher. In terms of how do we fund these open access journals, we have a mixed pot. We have a fruit salad of um, gold, of green and of diamond, um, but we have found that about 45% of the 195 open access journals um, is gold open access, um, and about 55% is diamond access. So it does give us a, a good idea that there's really some buy-in into um, open access, um, et cetera. So a little bit about my organization. So we are the National um, Science Academy in South Africa. We're a very young institution. We only started to work in 2002. And what is very important is to note that we are funded by the Department of Science and Innovation. So indirectly, although we are um, absolutely um, independent from government, we are funded by them. And then it makes us sort of. Um, a government institution. So that also implies that we do have access to specific monies. I do apologize for the quality of this particular image. It has been very difficult to get sort of a high quality one. So there's nothing wrong with your eyes. Don't adjust your cameras or your glasses. Uh, but I just wanted to show you that that this program has actually been preempted by um, uh, consensus, evidence-based studies on of scholarly publishing in South Africa, which came up with a number of recommendations which really guide and direct the work that we do. And it's a very important um, document for us specifically in the program. So saying that means that uh, the scholarly publishing program of which I am then involved in is then very firmly embedded in the South African national um, system of innovation and the national development plan. So it's really part of a much higher governmental sort of efforts to advance scholarly publishing um, in the country. So we play an extremely important role to um, enhance national capacity, um, to innovate, to produce and to publish research. We do policy um, in information, we, we, we give advice. Um, we advance and democratize knowledge and facilitate equality and inclusion of opportunity and increase the quality and visibility of South African research publications. That's, that's major in the work that we do. But what is, what is very different from when we started with open access in those years of 2002, 2003, is of late, we are very embedded into a very strong value system of quality, integrity, equity, fairness, collective benefit, diversity, and inclusiveness. And the reason for this, that it's really actually so encompassive and so huge, is the fact also of the history that, we've, that we um, are facing um, in South Africa, which is very important. So in my stepping back, I was looking at sort of how do we advance the equity and the inclusiveness to the access to scholarly journals, um, et cetera, in South Africa. So we have many services in which we are trying especially for emerging researchers, um, re new researchers that have come on board, um, editors, I mean, um, how do we help them to make the playing field equitable and inclusive? And as you can see, there's a whole variety of services that we provide them free of charge. Um, and most of, uh, of, well, all of our webinars, et cetera, of course, that's, so that's for free. And if we have physical meetings, we actually sponsor them so that we can build this capacity within the national system of innovation. 
I think one very important platform that we do support is CLO. And I'm quite sure you're all aware of CLO and the CLO network, um, which has its main office in Brazil. Um, and we have the CLO South Africa collection. So we view the collection then as South Africa's premier open access full text journal database in service of the South African research community. So it's free to access and it's free to publish on this platform, but not every journal can actually reach this platform. We have huge peer review panels which review each and every journal. So all 322, I can gratefully say, um, we have completed all the reviews on those journals and we will most probably start again this year to see how they fare in terms of the reviews. Again, this is a national asset. It is funded by the Department of Science and Innovation and therefore we can provide a number of services free to the journals on our platform like membership to Crossref, long-term preservation, um, publishing advice, training, setting up code of best practices, et cetera. I want to change a little bit of gears because I think this has not been addressed during any of the previous previous um, presentations. So the only journal which we really own, which is a diamond open access journal and has an impact factor of 2.5 and a very high rejection rate of 93%. Um, and, and we believe it's because the quality and the very high standards that we adhere to. It is funded then by the, the by Department of Science and Innovation, and therefore we have to ensure that this journal perform at any point in time and that it adheres to the most strictest um, standards, etc. So, as I alluded to, is that we have got a, we do have quite a particular historical past. So, at the moment, we have eleven acknowledged and accredited languages in South Africa. The twelfth one is sign languages. Um, we are known for our history of historical inequality, and especially in access to knowledge and scholarly publishing, it was thrive. So with, through the SIJS, which is interdisciplinary, we have then authors and readers across a wide range of fields. So it's then the mission of the South African Journal of Science to have the highest quality science across disciplinary and language divides, because that's a challenge we have. So it is designed to include and not to exclude, and it has an impact on how we report on social descriptors. So on the my right hand side, you actually see um, the social descriptors that I'm actually alluding to. So they, they're quite contentious and they're quite hot and um, they are very important for us. So what does the SIJS then, then view as then as accessible um, language? So there you can see a whole list um, and I don't want to read through all of them, but just to touch upon a few important ones, is it shouldn't be over technical, it shouldn't be unnecessarily long, um, repetition and sweeping statements should be avoided, idiomatic speech to, con to um, avoid confusion, and then of course the authors, what is their responsibility is to be precise, specific, wherever possible, to use the actor voice, and to explain technical terms necessary to contribution so that scientists from other disciplines may understand. So we're opening up the whole research process and the understanding of research as such. So this SIJ is inclusive language acknowledges also the diversity and is very sensitive to differences and it conveys respect to all people. So one individual group should not imply superiority over another group based on the gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, or even disability. So in some institutes, we recommend that social descriptors can, um, well, it cannot be avoided, but we do um, recommend that they avoid it. So in such situations, they are actually encouraged to avoid stereotyping or cultural assumptions. So authors must reflect on whether it is really relevant to use descriptors that prefer to race, ethnicity, nationality, disability, health status, and age. And it's sometimes very difficult, um, but there's, there's a, quite awareness that has to be um, created around that. There's so, a story to jump up, sorry to jump up, but we are very tight on time and I want to preserve some time for discussion. So just a reminder about time. Thank you. Absolutely. So there are concerns and we try to counter argument it by to say, but um, the SIJS is really 
committed to rigorous peer review. And we also um, we also support well-informed evidence-based uh, evidence opinion, but not populist de declarations, which I think is very important. Another publication of ours where we try to open up and to give access to scholars, um, the youth and general public to scientific findings is through our Quest magazine, which try and address and also help school children to access um, knowledge as such. We also have the Colisa platform, where we host journals very cheaply, um, but then all the standards that we push towards our South African Journal of Science, we push towards these journals. They are mainly um, also diamond open access to so these journals, um, although I can see that some of them are actually trying to go gold. This is also a very interesting journal. I'm almost done, Malavika. So just a second for me, then I'll wrap up. And that is to say, this is how, how South African journals actually interpret um, inclusive language policy. So this particular journal, um, they are recommending additional abstracts in um, other languages of our country, and then verbal as abstracts. So we have quite a bit where there's an audio where it actually relates um, the content of the article then to um, the users, which is a very interesting one as such. And they're also very clever in how they um, solicit some funding for their journal, and that's through advertisements. Um, and they seem to attract quite interesting advertisements as well. And then the certification of translation, which is very important because if you if you translate, you you want um, it to be correct, etc. So then, how do we go forward? I'm wrapping up. Um, how do we change the scientific um, culture? Is we have to move from competition to collaboration. We have to boost participatory science between scientists, but also scientists and society and specifically in this in the um, scholarly publishing community we need to have trust and open source and open access journal repositories with quality content and i think some of our previous speakers have started to elude especially in the green um, open access is that repositories are still playing a very important role and we find that the repositories in south africa that the role thereof is diminishing so we have to push very hard now for preprint repositories and the role they can play. So we have to seek alternatives to provide fee-free services. Cross-subsidization, I think that is very important. Where came you and, uh, and um, Ross in some way, as uh, their model is actually talking about cross-subsidization -subsidiz when the um, funding targets have been reached. So, so I think that's the type of models we have to look at. And we really need to uh, overall of outdated scholarly publishing practices. I, I think uh, we must, in, in the open science slash open access world, we have to change our rhetoric to, to regain our footprint in terms of open access. Um, because sometimes if I look at the debate in taking place internationally, I am a little bit concerned about the sustainability and the future of open access itself. itself. So open science policies are critical and core. We are waiting in South Africa for hours to be published, which is not. So that actually diminishes um, a lot of funding efforts towards open um, access. And we need to support this whole value system um, that it is bringing about. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for opening up the thinking. And while uh, we will have now all speakers, I hope, coming up on your screen, I know that Danny needs to leave in a little bit of a hurry. So I'm going to kick off with a question particularly facing uh, um, uh, Danny, uh, but also other panelists to come in is, is around, and I'm gathering two or three other questions up together in this. How do we scale? and still keep things sustainable. And in there, the questions particularly for you, Danny, is what sorts of organizations are you getting the funding in from? And how do you approach people who are outside the scholarly publishing world and don't know this sphere? And you know what, what, what's that like? But predominantly, how do we scale and make things sustainable? So it's an interesting question because ultimately, you know, we publish uh, like 160 articles a year. So we're, you know, it's not, not a huge operation, but, you know, it's, a, it's big enough. But really, we find that we like we never refuse a paper because of 
a lack of capacity. So part part of what we do is, you know, we respond to the to the community. If people submit their paper to us, we review it and then we decide whether to publish or not based on the science. But we our impact factor, we've only recently got an impact factor in the past uh, six months. So a lot of people's wages in especially in low middle income countries are, are linked to the impact factor of the journals that they publish in. So there's only X amount of people who would who would want to publish with us. And so really it's our mission and our aim is to um to attract as many of those people as we possibly can. And ultimately some people have um money to publish. So you know they will choose uh, a better better known journal or you know they wouldn't publish with us because they they you know want to have the um the bigger um scope so really in terms of us as an organization um scaling isn't an issue because we're we're really publishing 100 percent of the of the articles that is, that are sent to us and and that, um are uh you know of a high enough quality um in terms of communicating uh it's it's tricky it is tricky but what we do is we look at the impact of what we do. So we approach authors and we have like an automatic um, impact evaluation scheme. So so where authors or re and readers will be, we approach them um, like a month after they've either read an article or published an article to see what that long-term impact is. You know, has reading this article improved your care for your cancer patients? So then it's it's not looking at the publication of the article is the as the end goal it's looking at what that then does to the readers and how they then treat patients and that is something that is easier to communicate with um with funders because if we're pre improving the care for cancer patients then that is something that, that funders can get behind and if i can just quickly squeeze in one other thing which was a question that came specifically your way danny before you leave is do you suggest to authors a particular fee that you know a suggested amount of x or do you leave it totally open well we we have like a, a like a sliding scale so you know if, if you if you uh, well we're just actually reviewing all of our, our messages to authors and to everyone else but so we suggest amounts so we have like trigger points that if you give 50 pounds then we'll be able to do this if we, you know, all the way up to five hundred pounds, and the the average donation from individual authors is a little bit less than two hundred pounds, so it's still pretty significant. And then our average uh, donation from from institutions is more like seven hundred, eight hundred pounds. Great, thank well, you, Denny, and and, and, have and, and you have to shoot off, so um, we will we will miss your further contributions. But thank you for making time. And if I can just ask the other panelists this question about um, scaling and keeping things sustainable, panelists, what what do you feel about that? And alongside that, if you can think also about answering a secondary question about regionality, because we've had a, quite an interesting question about. Is there any negative feedback you've received if if and where you've got a regional focus, right? So um, sometimes to say you will be published for free because you are under-resourced can be something quite um, humiliating. I'm not saying you're putting it in those words, but if that's the general thrust of it, that can come across uh, in a negative way. So have you seen some of that? Are you concerned about that? So scaling and sustainability and any negative perceptions on the regional aspect. Panelists, I open it to all of you. Thank you, Malavika. I can give it a go if, if that's helpful. Sure. So in, terms, so in terms of scaling, you know, we, for instance, is a national sort of um, initiative. So it's very difficult to actually scale it. But I can see as being financial resources are getting critical and low at some times, you know, um, especially from, from a government point of view, I mean, um, eco economies changes in countries, et cetera, then we'll have to, then we do look at other things um, to start scaling down. Um, for instance, the 322 South African scholarly journals, they um, do generate some funding for the institutions, but now we're moving over to a new publications quality framework. So quality is giving it away. So we will instill a very strict criteria. So I can imagine that those numbers of 322 will get down um, to get to a more achievable and handleable and sustainable number um, in going forward. Um, 
And then perhaps just just on the regi regionality, um, you know, what is sort of the the, the uh, perception out there, and what how do people um, react to that? Well, it depends. I find mainly on the focus of a journal. If if it's in the journal's interest to to look at regionality and look at regional solutions for things, then they will accept that. And but um, I, I find there is a little bit of a um, a negativity towards a sort of a regional focus of journals, except for, for South African journals where region regionality is very important, but I think internationally it, it does sometimes deter um, some manuscripts to be published. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Ross, any other thoughts from, from you? Yeah, I should note that although when I talk about having a focus on authors from the global south, I guess I'm thinking about the difference between equity and equality and that difference between giving the same thing to everyone versus thinking about how we can try to actually kind of even up the playing field. But I will also note that we opened up Bloomsbury Open Collections to many other authors. We are publishing uh, some of those books that will go away have American authors, some of them have European authors. Um, and I absolutely recognize, I think if you talk to say our literary studies authors, they would say, we have no way to go away. We don't have grants. No one sees us. We're not a global challenge. No, we're not. We don't sit nicely in a sustainable development goal. Um, you know, we value that work. We publish it. Um, obviously the authors value it. They don't have a route to publish open access very often. So I absolutely think that the inability to publish open access, the lack of equity in open access goes far beyond regionality. It also extends to, to subjects, it extends to where you are in your career and that we need to be thinking about all of that. But do I think it's unreasonable to focus on schemes like Blues Open Collections on those authors over authors who, for example, have access to funding for BPCs through their funders? No, I think that that is absolutely reasonable. There is no point giving, um, you know, providing authors the route to publish OA when they already have one. And that actually wouldn't enable us to kind of expand open access. And I will also say we did this in really close collaboration with the author base. We, we spoke to them as we were developing it. This isn't something that we foisted on people. We would never, you know, authors had a free choice whether or not to participate. And actually the original idea was can we make the, that, that number of 20, it's partly because it seemed like a kind of not too big, not too small. It means that we can um, make a substantial-ish intervention, um, in the, but also it's not forcing a whole bunch of titles on libraries. It's not kind of forcing a big deal on them. But actually the original idea was, can we make the whole of our African studies and international development lists OA, regardless of where those authors are, they just happen to have a higher proportion of authors. So perhaps I've mispitched that a little bit as I was talking about it. Um, so I'm not sure if I've given a direct answer, but I will also say scaling, yeah, our, one problem with the subscribe to open the collective action models is I think they are harder to scale and that's something we're thinking about really seriously and I guess I might note in the interest of transparency that we publish about 1200 monographs a year so we do have a long way to go. Great thank start. you thank you Roz and then very very quickly Megan if you can just tell us how does it work for licensing green content and do you know what proportion of AAAS content is actually out there available green? Yep, it's a great question. I So first of all, I, I don't know what uh, proportion of content is out there available green. I just hear from the authors who put their AAM out there and find it a great way to do open access. But I'm going to look into this. So if anyone's interested, um, I can share my email and you're welcome to follow up with me on that. Um, in terms of our policies and licensing, uh, I'll just put a link in the chat to open access at AAAS and science. Um, someone had asked about the CC, CC BY license. Yes, Yes, authors can put that on the author accepted manuscript if they have a funder mandate. Uh, it is it is what Coalition S, S asks for. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Now, I know that we are at time, but we will work to get your answers to you in a narrative form and it will be posted because there are some great questions here. And, you know, this, this is an ongoing discussion, uh, equity and open access. We have a long way to go and lots to learn. So thank you to everyone who was part of this. A special thanks to our speakers who made time for us and thanks to the Events Hub who help us do this stuff. Ruby, I will hand back to you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thanks, Malavika. Thanks to our panel today. And once again, a big thanks to our sponsors who help us to make these webinars available to everyone.